This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with performance coach John Haim. The director of New Edge Performance discusses the importance of self-awareness in athletes and how you can support an athlete in gaining this, the challenges in self-confidence and the work he's done with professional athletes from sports such as the NBA and MLB, as well as the psychological and physiological factors behind the yips. As always, if you enjoy this conversation, please make sure you share us with family and friends as we are continuously looking to grow our audience. I hope you enjoy. So perfect. First of all, John, I really appreciate you giving up a bit of time. I know obviously a mutual friend of us put us in touch when I asked him for some people who might be interested. You were the first name on Sanju's list, which is brilliant. Um, how are you? Are you all safe and well? Yes, we're fine, uh, Michael. I'm in Canada, in Ottawa, Canada, and we're just uh, heading into the third lockdown. So, <laughs> so we're not excited about that for sure. But, uh, you know, we know we're near the end of this. I think everybody listening to, we know we're near the end of this uh, and we're, I think all of us are tired of it too at this point. So we'll all be happy to kind of move forward and it's impacted sport in a big way. We can talk about that today, certainly on the podcast, but it's impacted sport in a big way. So it's going to be nice to get out and see the athletes again and work with them. And instead of zoom calls and all this sort of thing. So yeah, things are great. Thank you for having me on your podcast. I've heard a lot of great things from Sanjeev about you and the podcast. And I love the fact that you're sort of widening the scope for people and uh, getting a broad perspective from uh, from different people. And that can be applied in so many different ways in sports. So uh, good on you for uh, for starting the podcast. And uh, it's a real service for people. And, and it's a it's a real knowledge builder for people. So uh, I was glad to see that. And I was, I was, you know, grateful when Sanjeev told me and said that I have an opportunity to contribute. Now, as I said, it's always good to steal. I always say the best coaches are the best thieves. So this has definitely been a learning experience for me in terms of talking to people like yourself and being able to take ideas away or consider what I do from a day-to-day basis. I'm sure you'll have that. So in terms of your background, um, Sandeep obviously did mention kind of some of the roles, et cetera, you had, and it's very diverse. So do you want to kind of go through some of the experiences you have and then what your current work looks like? Yeah, so I think uh, diverse is the word because I started, uh, I grew up in the golf business. My father was a golf professional. So I learned uh, the business of golf. Uh, I have an, I had an affinity for golf. I, I, I became, you know, reasonably good at it. I would say I went to school in the U S on a full scholarship, athletic scholarship. Um, I did well, I would say in college, and then I turned professional and I played professional golf for about six and a half years. So my background is certainly in that game in golf, my family, my brother is a golf professional. Uh, he has a business in Canada, uh, around golf. Uh, so sort of, I moved in, I went a different, he went into business. I went in a different way. I went into playing. So I played for six and a half years. I played all around the world. I played a bit in Europe. I played Canada. I played in the U S I played in Australia. I played in South Africa. I played in Asia, uh, played around the globe. It was exciting, Michael, as a, as a 20 year old or, a you know, a 21 year old to travel around the globe and, and sort of try to reach your targets and, and explore your passion. And it was fantastic. Unfortunately, I had a bit of an injury in sort of the sixth year, I hurt my hand. So golfers, especially if you're practicing a lot and you're a professional golfer, there's a lot of pounding in the hands and the arms. So I just had this little injury. It was a nagging injury I couldn't get rid of. And it slowed me down, I would say, a little bit in my career. So I, I moved on. I got into business and kind of moved through a few different roles in business uh, before I started to um, develop a relationship with a a leadership consulting firm. And they kind of took me under their wing, taught me the ropes. Uh, I built a company uh, from this. I built a company that was called Learning Links. 
and we developed workplace learning programs and I integrated uh, what I knew about golf uh, into the programs. And these programs were quite popular. In fact, I got uh, hired by a large international consulting firm in the US to deliver this particular program all around the globe. So I did a lot in Asia. I delivered in Asia for about five years. Uh, it was great. Um, I got other opportunities as a result. I started to move up in some of the organizations and coach some of the sort of sales teams. And I moved up to the executive teams. Um, and I started executive coaching. And I learned sort of that over about a five year period. Um, now, Getting back to sports, uh, one, of the, one of the executives asked me to help his daughter, who is a tennis player. He said, you play professional sport. You have this background in you know, what you're doing with us. Can you do the same thing with her that you're doing with us? I don't want you to change anything. So it was the same sort of conceptual model, but it was different. That's the problem. So I started to work with her and I went back and forth from Asia to Canada and I did trial and error. I did my homework. I educated myself. I took courses. I did certifications to try to develop a model that could help athletes. So I took my basic executive coaching model, which is a process, you know, to take somebody from where they currently are to where they want to go. Um, I built it for athletes. So I built this model over about a five year period. Anyway, she did really well. So that was very helpful. So she ended up being kind of one of the top players in her age category in Asia. And we developed her and she went step by step and we had some success with her. Came back to Canada and started getting calls from agents uh, to help other athletes in other sports. So that's basically how my current job. Now I currently work in across three genres. I work uh, in sports, uh, in professional sports. Primarily, I would say um, I work in corporate, so I still executive coach and I work in entertainment, too. So I work across three different areas, all performance, all high performance. So uh, and that's where I am today. And I love it. Um, you know, I'm always looking for different challenges. I just wrote a book for the equestrian world. I got into equestrian about six years ago. I wrote a book around confidence. I felt like it was a much needed book in the equestrian world around confidence because I feel like there's, and it's, it's not only in equestrian, it's in other areas too, where there's a bit of a crisis in confidence, I find. Uh, so we wrote the book on that. And so I'm trying to work in these different areas to challenge myself and, and to grow all the time and to develop myself and develop my own skills too. So, um, so you're right, it's very diverse. <laughs> very serendipitous too as I moved to different things I, I sort of I saw something that I really liked and I pursued it and I had a passion for it and uh, and I love helping people uh, I have a fantastic client base uh, of all sorts of diverse you know clients I guess in 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 the different areas in the three different buckets um, the, the past couple of years, I've been focusing on sport, professional sports, primarily NBA, NHL, PGA Tour, NFL, uh, MLS a little bit, uh, ATP tennis, equestrian sport, PSA World Tour, squash. Um, so, so it's been really fun. It's been, a, it's been really fun. And I look forward to what's ahead, too. So I'm always trying to learn my craft. So in terms of um, with the athletes and you're obviously trying to make them more high performing, that's essentially a part of your role. Yeah, that's uh, the job. Initially, what what do you need to know about the athlete or how do you get to know what you need to know about the athlete <clears throat> in order to help them? And then what type of processes do you try and put in place to try and assist the athlete um, in that high performing lifestyle? Yeah, so I, I, the, the, big, the big word there is process, because when I was playing professional sport, I was working with all sorts of different uh, coaches. So there was technical, there was physical, there was strategic, and then obviously there's the mental and the emotional piece. That, that one always fell through the cracks. So technically, great. Uh, people knew what they were doing, and we developed the technical skills and developed them to a high level, a professional level. And then the physicality, obviously, you have to complement 
the technical skills with the physicality, just like you have to do in football, right? You have to be a certain at a certain level of fitness in order to take advantage of these technical skills. And then you have to understand it's the reading the game. It's the strategic piece, understanding the game and having a head for the game. And then there's this mental and emotional piece. And, you know, most athletes, they get a few sessions with a sports psych or they uh, read a book or this is where this is where I really was trying to differentiate our company to develop a process. And, and getting back to your question at the front end of the question, I have to understand everything about an athlete. I have to talk to coaches. I have to talk to parents. We assess. We have assessment tools. We assess them. We talk to them. So we watch them play, we watch them train, we watch them compete. So really understanding what makes them tick. I mean, my job is not about necessarily fixing things. My job is about development, developing the skills needed, the mental and the emotional skills needed, where they can unlock these other pieces, the great technical skills, the great physical skills, the great strategic skills. Um, and I find, I don't know what you think, I'm sure you, you, you may see the same thing, but, um, you know, I see a lot of athletes with very good technical skills. I see a lot of athletes with very good physical skills. It's impossible to be a top level, for example, football player without great technical skills. Uh, you also have to have great physical skills, the level of fitness. You have to be able to read the game and have that capacity to see the game and to know what to do. Uh, in different situations on the pitch. But then there's this other piece that seems to, like I said, fall through the cracks, this mental and emotional piece. And I, I, there's, there's not a process to, to necessarily develop it. So we put together a process to develop it. It's a year-long process where the first six months is fairly intensive on development and building the skills. The second six months is more mentoring to make sure that the skills and the habits are sticking and they're able to integrate them into their uh, competitive life. And my entire job, Michael, honestly, is to create an independent athlete where they can self-diagnose and they can help themselves. And they're a confident, independent athlete. That's my job. Then I go away, <laughs> you know, so send John away. He's done his job. Um, the athlete knows what to do. They're maximizing, hopefully, their abilities. That's what they look for from me in the first place is to be able to, they have these abilities. How do you maximize them? So that's my job to do that. So the process is the big part. It really is. You have to have a process to develop these skills. And there's very little out there with respect to taking an athlete on the front end, assessing them, talking to everybody, understanding them, seeing them play, seeing them train, and then isolating really what they need to develop and work on and then building those skills over time. So like you would in a, in a, in a technical environment or a physical environment, you evaluate what's weak or what's strong, and then you put them, put the athlete through a developmental process. Does and that so, make sense? Yeah, for sure it does. And then I guess the question for me is, do you have um, set set processes that you you use on all athletes or do you make it individualized and specialized depending on what that athlete needs well there's there's a general process but it's always customized because every athlete is different for sure so especially at the athletes at the very elite elite level whether they're playing professional sports whether it's professional basketball in the nba or professional hockey or professional football or whatever the sport is. Yes, there's a general process. And I could, I could show that to you right now. I could show you step by step by step over the six months and then the back six months. We have it all documented. We have every document we use. We have every podcast that we present, for example, to an athlete. We have every document that we use with athletes. But all of that is interchangeable based on what the athlete actually needs. And every, every athlete that I have, every client that I have obviously is different. So I take that process and I present that process to them, but we move the pieces around and then we pull in different pieces depending on what they need. So yes, there's a process, definitely a defined process, but it's always customized based on what the athlete needs. 
Okay, so obviously you mentioned kind of the first six months is where you look make you look to make a lot of the gains in terms of a lot of support and then you mentor from there. So within yep. those first six months, what um, what assessments are going on? What documents roughly are you using? Like, so what does that look like? From you, we, we talk about that process. What does that actually look like? What type of things would the athletes be going through during that first six months? Well, we'd assess them first. And then, you know, based on the assessment results, we'll look at, you know, strengths, limitations. I'll also build, I, I put together a, a really defined, concise, step-by-step -step plan for them too. So they, they share with me what they want to do. So where you want to go. So my basic job really is to close a gap for an athlete. So they tell me, okay, here's where I am right now. Or I say to them, here's where you are right now. And then we talk about where they want to go in a realistic sort of, you know, within their own capabilities and uh, technical, physical, uh, strategic capabilities, what is possible. And then we build out the, the plan for them. And within that plan, you know, often there's, there's, uh, there's, there's conversations with the coach, with their coach, particularly it could be an indiv if it's an individual sport, it's the individual coach. If it's the team sport, it's the team coach. Uh, there's a lot of input from the coach too, on what they watching the athlete every day, what they feel like they need. And then we shape the plan based on some of that feedback. So we take all the pieces that we learn. So from the coach, um, from the assessment, certainly. So we'll give them one of the assessments I use is I assess emotional competencies of the athlete. So we have self-awareness, uh, self-confidence, self-reliance, uh, flexibility, focus, achievement, drive, optimism, all these pieces that we assess them on. And then we sit down and talk about those particular things and how we're going to develop each competency with them. Now they might have capability, really great capability in some of the confidence competencies. So we integrate that into the plan so that they can play to those strengths, but we'll take the development pieces and build out the, the development pieces. So it could be self-awareness, which is always, always the starting point for performance in my business as working in performance, self-awareness is the backbone. It's the foundation. If you don't have it, then it's really difficult uh, to move forward. In, so how in would you develop that? Because I'd imagine a lot of athletes would have gone through their formative years of being told what to do by a coach or told how to feel or how to act. So if you've got an athlete who's like that, either in their early professional career or later within their um, college careers, etc. How do you go around developing their level of self awareness to a point where they can understand themselves as an athlete and what they're good at and what they're not? So there's a lot of pieces, Michael, to self awareness. Um, you know, the strengths, obviously. Uh, what are your strengths? What are you good at naturally? Um, what do you struggle with? What are your limitations? Um, how do you deal with those? You know, how do you angle your strengths to, to make sure that what you do well is showing up if it's on the pitch, if it's, if it's in the ring, if it's uh, on the court, whatever it is. And then you have to get into things like really significant, uh, uh, grounded pieces like values, like what do you believe in? So we construct an, an entire value uh, system based on what they believe in. So that's a lot of work digging into that and figuring that out. So what does the athlete actually believe in? Is it, do they, is it being highly competitive? Is it passion? Is it being professional on the pitch? Is it enjoyment? Like there's a million different, as you know, there's a million different potential values. So we help them identify what's really important to them so they can live them every day. And the behaviors and the actions that they sort of are, are showing every day are reflected in those values. That's really, really important that you know that. You have to know what you believe in. Then there's, of course, things like purpose. Why are you doing it? Like, why are you actually playing and grounding yourself in that purpose and bringing it to the pitch every day? And um, it's amazing that if you can put that on the front end and get that, you know, get an athlete really expressing that day to day, that's a big factor in the whole thing. Then you get into an athlete's voice, their own narrative. 
Um, what are they saying to themselves? Where's that coming from? How is that self-image being shaped? So there's a lot of really grounded, important pieces here before we can move forward. Um, emotional intelligence is progressive. So you start with self-awareness and then you can build from there. If you don't have the self-awareness piece, it's an extremely steep climb up the hill because uh, a lot of times in corporate, for example, people start with building relationships and empathy and everything, but the, we have to back up a lot of the times because that particular individual, if we're gonna develop those competencies, we have to develop the self-awareness first because if you can't lead yourself, you can't lead other people. So you need to really get a handle on yourself first. And the athlete is exactly the same way. You need to build that self-awareness and focus on the self-awareness. The voice is critical. What is the athlete telling themselves? Where is the narrative come from? How do you shape that narrative? Can you shape that narrative? Um, because a lot of times that narrative is preventing them from fully expressing themselves and maximizing their abilities. So that's where we sort of start with the self-awareness piece. And then we build out from there, but you always have to start there. And would that be, would that be like one conversation? Would that be multiple? Oh no, that's that that, written down. What does that, that look like? That's time. That's time. That's time consuming. It takes time to build that. That is not, that is not one conversation. That is pieces that must be built and shaped over time. So they might take the, for example, they, I might assess them early in the game. And then we, you know, we will start with the self-awareness and then we'll start talking about confidence. What is confidence? How do you build it out? What are the threats to your confidence? All these sorts of pieces that we build out over time. But I would say probably I might spend, boy, a month, a month and a half, a month or a month and a half on self-awareness because it's so important and it's so critical for them moving forward. If you can really, if you can really develop it and build it and understand it early, you can imagine, right? And this is the beautiful thing, Michael, about sport too, is I have the opportunity to, to help these young athletes through their passion, develop these skills that they are going to need in a very big way later on in their lives. So you're really doing a service uh, to the athletes. This is a big investment, like to be able to do this with an athlete to work on these mental and emotional pieces early, especially the self-awareness piece. If you, can, if you can understand that early in the game in your life, you can imagine you know, working with a 15 year old and them really getting a handle on that. That just, it really opens the door for them and it unlocks a lot of things for later in life too. So that's the beautiful thing. I mean, that's one of the primary, that's one of our primary, it's mine, it's yours. It's one of our primary roles in sport is to be able to help these young people develop these skills that they're going to need for later on. Because many of them, as you know, are not going to go on and play professional sport. They're going to go into business. They're going to go into this. They're going to go into that. So if you can shape and develop these competencies these fantastic competencies through their passion which is sport early so you've got their attention um you can really do something so uh it's important and i think one of the things you you mentioned there which i think is a really interesting point is around the narrative that they tell themselves um and i think that actually that's a really powerful tool that people probably don't realize enough in terms of how what is your frame of mind going into any event or going into a game or going into training are you telling yourself that you're out of your depth or are you telling yourself that you're going to really excel are you telling yourself it's going to be a development day so in terms of where people gather information for that narrative in terms of external factors that come in, but also internal experiences within your um, work and your experience, where do you see those narratives being produced? And is there any common themes that you look at and say, actually, that's something that as a, as a sport, as a whole, we could really improve and help our athletes a lot in this area? The book I just wrote, Michael, for the equestrian world, Ride Big, I wrote a chapter on the voice, I call it the narrative. Uh, and there's a process to go through to really sort of check in with yourself. And essentially what you're looking for in the voice is the truth, because it has a tendency not to tell you the truth, right? 
it will create little things uh, that aren't the truth. So you're pulling, to answer your question, you're pulling from experience, you're pulling from training, you're pulling from all these different things. And you have to establish and make sure that the truth is woven in through the narrative. So you got to be really careful. So you have to ask yourself a lot of questions, certainly, right? Because the, the tendency for human beings is to be negative. We always want to kind of say, put the reins on and say, whoa, because we're trying to protect ourselves, right? It's a security thing. One of the big needs in life is to stay safe and to stay secure. So the tendency sometimes is for us to kind of put a hold on everything and say, just stop. And, and to protect ourselves. So there's a negativity woven in through that. So, and that can be woven in through the voice too and through the narrative. So you really have to make sure that if you're a good player, for example, that that comes out in the narrative and you're not pulling yourself and holding yourself back. People hold themselves back. People pull themselves back. People get in their own way. And often that narrative is preventing them from moving forward. I always say it's the gatekeeper in confidence. The narrative ultimately is the gatekeeper in confidence. So you have self-awareness and then you're building things, your training, your preparation. You know, how do you train? Uh, do you train really well? Do you have a process for training to develop and kind of move incrementally forward? Preparation is the same way. How do you prepare? Do you have a set way to prepare? And do you, are you able to sort of put yourself in a position to maximize your abilities? But we finally get to the gatekeeper and the gatekeeper can change everything because at the 11th hour for me in my business in the, at the 11th hour, if the athlete is competing in the Olympics or they're competing in a big professional event or whatever it is, if the voice starts acting up at the 11th hour and is not listening to the truth, then there's a problem. So that voice has to be shaped properly and there's a process to doing it. I, I go through the process in the book where people can check in with themselves and make sure that the truth is coming out. That's the critical piece. Um, so, so those would are you big say, things. Would you say that links to like the yips and stuff? We talk about yips in golf or you see pitches in the MLB or the England football team, for example, there's a massive narrative about England not being able to take penalties or you've seen it on a golf course where all of a sudden, They've the narrative been unbelievable. Is yes. They've been the around unbelievable is, for three yeah. rounds and 17 holes. It gets to the last one and all of a sudden they go into the bunker. Then they go into trees and stuff. Do you think it is the narrative you're telling yourself in those pressurized situation that causes a lot of the issues? Definitely. And, and, you know, a lot of what you're talking about is focused around fear in golf. It's the fear of missing. And the problem in golf is that you miss so much like the best golfers in the world, when you look at their putting statistics, they're not great, really. And those are the best putters in the world. So imagine the guy who never practices and he, he misses, he almost misses every putt. So does that get into your head? Of course it does. And then it becomes a fear of missing and you're focusing on the result instead of the process of actually just making the putt and understanding that the statistics that you're not going to make many putts, like you're going to miss a lot. So, you know, put the best possible stroke you can on it. And if you miss, you miss. If you make, you make. That, that's the reality of, of putting. The yips, is, the yips is psychological. It's neurological, too. There's been all sorts of research around the yips. A lot of the research to me is vague. Um, but it's definitely when you move towards, you know, the, the, the primary reason for the yips, it is psychological and it's fear of missing, it's fear of failure, it's fear of making a mistake, uh, which is woven through, oh my God, the fear of making a mistake is so prevalent in every sport, especially with young athletes. There's always that fear of making a mistake because we're always trying to be perfect and, you know, People are telling us that we need to be perfect and we need to have great grades and perfect grades and everything. And it's just woven through everything. So yeah, the yips is interesting. I mean, but it's neurological too. There's some people that have a tendency or a, an inclination towards sort of a, a, a tremoring motor skills. Uh, it's like Parkinson's disease, right? So they've done research around that, but then the psychological piece of that, if you have a tendency towards that, and then you also have the psychological piece, it's a disaster. That's where pitchers are, you know, throwing the ball into the ground and you're seeing people do crazy things with their hands in golf and, and all sorts of different things. So 
it's primarily, I would say, psychological, but there's also in a, in a small select sample of the population, there's also this neurological piece too that, uh, that plays into it. So the yips, yeah, don't even mention the yips, Michael. <laughs> That's, the yips is a bad word. <laughs> So when right. we're looking at fear of failure, obviously this, a lot of it is going to come down to what you said before, the narrative you're telling yourself, your experiences you've had, the confidence you have. So when you're looking at managing that within an athlete or getting them to accept that there may be failure and try and move past that, I mean, the classic Michael Jordan quote is that he missed 32,000 last minute shots to allow him to make the one that wins a championship and whatnot. Right. How how do you go about with younger athletes getting them to understand that actually there's going to be failure in your journey and it's about being able to assess that in an appropriate way and carry on moving forward? We always kind of take an approach where it's about the thing is, too, you, uh, for most athletes, uh, especially individual athletes, you don't win very often. So it's all about winning and learning and always trying to get closer to winning. Are you going to lose? Are you going to fail? Absolutely. And you have to embrace those moments as learning opportunities. So you take those, what did I learn? So like I said, we're always trying to get closer to winning. So if you don't win, if you go in and you don't win, you reflect, you evaluate, what did I learn? And I'm trying to get closer to winning next time. So we're always trying to get closer to winning always that's our that's always the goal so failure we and we always try to frame failure as a positive thing um you know exactly the things you talk about the michael jordans and all these examples that everybody always has of people missing a million shots and then making a shot or i've missed way more than i've ever made and that's that's true in everything you know it's interesting in professional sports a guy on the pga tour for example he plays in 25 maybe tournaments a year 22 tournaments a year depending on schedules if they win one tournament it's an amazing year so it means you've lost 21 times or 22 times so you really have to have uh, a process to deal with that so i didn't lose but i got closer to winning the next year maybe the next year i win two tournaments and that's a that's a big jump forward and that's a big movement forward So you're one of the best golfers in the world, but you lose 22 out of 25 times. So that's just the reality of sport. So you have to have a framework around that, a perception around that and uh, failure, mistakes, all those things. The mistakes thing is huge too with, with respect to athletes. There's the fear of making mistakes. So, um, and that ties into- Why do you think that is? it's tied into all sorts of things. Perfectionism is, is rampant in, in a lot of the sport today where we're always trying to be perfect. Um, and, and, you know, it really is perfectionism is about sort of the fear of making mistakes. It really is. So it, it's it, the other big fear, Michael too, today is the fear of other people's opinions. That's huge for me. That's the biggest one. So there's this fear of what other people are going to think, how other people are going to judge you. Um, there's just more, there's just more uh, eyes on sport, I guess, these days. So this fear has grown. So I've seen it in the last 10 years with social media, with, uh, with the ability to watch things on the internet, there's just eyes everywhere. And athletes know that. So there's this fear of, of being judged all the time and the fear of other people's opinions. And it locks, it definitely locks athletes up. So you have to deal with that one too. And how, how would you do that with the athletes you've worked with? Um, I guess with the question guys that you're working with at the moment, how, how do you go about accepting that social media is a part of their life, but also getting them to move away from external validation? So we're always trying to uh, develop what's called with an athlete. It's a, an approach I call inside out. So you're always trying to compete or express yourself from inside out. So that that's where we back up now. And we go back to the self-awareness, the values, the purpose, all the things that relate to the athlete that are important instead of these things coming from the outside, which are, which would be outside in. So instead of being driven by these factors outside of them, other people's opinions, 
um, all sorts of different factors. They're driven by their own structure, which is the values, the purpose, uh, their own limitations, their own strengths, everything they know about themselves. So that's why in the first place we build that so we can eliminate those things coming from the, from the outside. So every one of the athletes that I work with, by the time we're finished at the end of, if it's 12 months, it could be extended. It could be a little shorter. I just use 12 months as an example. Um, they're competing, they're expressing themselves from the inside out, and they do not feel those external pressures coming from the outside. So that's, that's a big part of it. So inside out, outside in, a lot of athletes are outside in athletes. They're driven by the pieces from outside of themselves. That's what drives, drives everything within them. And that's a problem. So we, we really, you know, my athletes are in a bubble. They're in their own sort of world. They're in their own bubble. And, uh, and they can express themselves well uh, within that sort of, you know, uh, inside out environment. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, no, it does for sure. I guess the question off the back of that is do your guys, uh, formula, uh, formalize it. So do they either produce a document where they say, these are my values. These are my non-negotiable. Absolutely. Myself? How, what does that look like? Everything. So, um, if it's a, if it's a, an athlete on a team, the values could be put up in the locker this is what I believe in. And this is my purpose. So I might focus on two for them, depending on what they need. Like I, like we talked about every athlete's different. So they might have, I usually ask them to, to create five critical values that are going to drive their behavior and actions every single day. And they have to pay attention to it every day. So if you believe in enjoyment, for example, or you believe in professionalism, how are you going to be professional every day? And we draft the entire thing out of exactly how they're going to be professional every day. And then they have to pay attention to that every day. If it's enjoyment, how are you going to enjoy yourself every day? You know, a lot of athletes don't have fun. They're not having fun. They're so focused on achievement that they forget that they're doing this because they love it. So how are you going to enjoy yourself every day? How are you going to feel the joy of the sport every day? What does that look like? And how are you going to express yourself to achieve that every day? So definitely everything is drafted out. Everything is written down and everything becomes a part of the day-to-day -day routine so that the habit is built that they can live those, those particular values every day. Um, you know, in corporate, when you walk into a company often, you'll see their values. They're sitting on the wall. We believe in integrity, honesty, da, 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 whatever, the, whatever the words are. But the problem is, is that they've sat down and done some work to create these values and what they believe in, but they don't live them. They're just sitting on the wall. So you have to bring them to life. How are you going to integrate it into your culture every day? How is the athlete going to integrate it into their culture every day, their personal culture? So that's how we do it. And yes, we just do not create these values and then they disappear every single day. They have to be a part of, and that's the work over the six months to make sure that's my job is to make sure I bug them enough to, uh, to make sure that those values are a part of their, their everyday routine for sure. And so how do, how do those values get challenged dependent on the organization or the team yeah. that they're in? Because I'd imagine, and I'm, I'm putting mm -hmm. this out there, I could be wrong, New England Patriots does not always look like the most enjoyable place to be. <laughs> it can be very snowy at points. It's cold. It seems like a very business, you know, military. This is what we're here to do. We're here to work, et cetera. If your thing is to go in and have fun and joke around, that might not yeah, Be not better. joke around. It's not have fun and joke around. It's to feel the joy of the sport and to integrate that joy in. It's yeah, that there's a distinction there. It's okay. not uh, so this particular athlete, maybe that we're talking about, the sort of if they're a New England Patriot, it would be a joy that they would feel inside of themselves. And how are they going to they're not, you know, going in to joke around, but there is leeway there too. There's a bit of leeway. There's and for me too, I talked about the communication with the coach. The coach will understand what the values of that particular athlete is. I would make sure that that's clear and that's highlighted what they are, but you're right. 
this is an interesting point you're making because sometimes the club or the organization has values and then you're bringing in another set of values, right? Your own values, but they can coexist together too. You can live both sort of types or both, uh, 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 you know, both sets of values, I guess, sorry. <laughs> uh, so the team's values, you can certainly live within those but you're also, you also have your own values that you're expressing every day. And I think they can coexist. They can really coexist together. So would you say effective teams um, or effective organizations essentially recruit personnel who have closer coexistence of values to what the company's ones are or what the leader's ones are? Or would you say that it needs to be really, really diverse across the board? No, I, I would hope that uh, I would hope that organizations and um, clubs, if you're talking about, are you talking about sport or corporate or both? It doesn't really matter, right? But both, I think. I think from my perspective, if you if you look at like the NBA, for example, if you've got twelve players, if one of your you know one of your real values as an organization is to care about the person as well as the player, if you recruited 10 people who really bought into that you might be able to do with one or two who don't who don't want to be in and around the team or whatnot and you know they want to be by themselves if you had it the other way around where you've got eight or ten people that aren't that interested in families or other people supporting other people then that that coexistent might not work i think you're looking for people that share uh common values michael definitely i think that's really uh, critical so the the um you know the the culture of the organization is is part of the culture of the organization is the values is the purpose um is all of these things and, and a really good organization a really good club understands and creates uh the culture that they want to have so i think it's really critical that you recruit people that are going to coexist within that culture and within those values that you create. Definitely. Yes. That that's, that's a must. So if a, if a club identifies what they're looking for, they're looking for a certain type of competitor, a certain type of person, and you have to go out. That's, that's your job is to go out and find uh, the, the athlete or the employee, whatever it is, that can coexist within that, within those values and that culture, and that will thrive within them. For example, um, in the NBA, uh, the Golden State Warriors, who have who have been very successful uh, this past year, they weren't. They had a lot of injury, but they they were on a, an amazing run of high level, high level performance. Uh, and Steve Kerr is their coach, and one of his one of his central. Uh, uh, values that he brings to the team, he brings to training, he brings to the games is joy. He wants the guys to have fun. He wants them to show up and have a have. And I'm not saying it's fooling around. It's expressing themselves, being able to express themselves, not not being afraid to make mistakes and having that joy to really express themselves the way they they would like to. The other one is passion. His other one is passion. So you wouldn't think that a professional coach a prof who is highly, highly successful, he's won eight NBA championships. So there must be something to this, right? So he integrates this joyful environment. And that means that people want to train. They want to be at the gym. They want to do well. They want to develop. They want to improve. And the joy is creating this entire culture is it's, it's sort of uh, surrounding this entire culture. So that's the power of values. So the, they won three NBA championships, the golden state warriors having primary uh, values of joy and passion, which you wouldn't think if you said, Oh, it, sh it should be mental toughness and it should be, uh, you know, military discipline, not quite because they just won three NBA championships and perhaps one of the hardest leagues in the world to win in. So, um, so it works. The values would, you, works. would you recommend for your athletes, if they are in free agency or they're looking at colleges or wherever they're going to try and find an organization or a club 
that also mirrors their values because at the point where they've maybe got a little bit of power they can try and find a culture that fits them to improve absolutely 100 percent. and i always you know when i when i recommend when some of the young athletes that i work with are going to colleges in the united states yes the school is important yes the reputation of the school yet yes the program you're looking for academically is important but the number one thing i always uh recommend is that they the first priority is the coach and what the coach believes in and the type of culture that the coach has built on that particular team because this person is going to influence you for four years they're going to be basically your your leader your guide your surrogate father or mother for four years so that's a critical critical alignment to to make sure that you share similar values and that that culture that you can thrive within that culture in that particular program so definitely 100 percent. okay so i think yes this is a slightly more challenging question in terms of longer term <clears throat> growth both as an athlete but also in terms of your self-reflection and your self-improvement how do you go about managing that over a sustained period of time so i, I look at it for example um between olympics you've got four year period if you've just competed in olympics to your next olympic cycle for you to be able to get into a good place where hopefully you're going to compete at this top end you're going to need some challenges some failure some really difficult times within those four years which you're going to have i look at the england rugby team for for example at the moment a lot of bad (coughs) results and they're getting a lot of external challenges from people saying the coaches aren't very good, the players aren't very good, et cetera, et cetera. Is so how, true? Do you go, how do you go around managing that as an athlete to, or a coach to accept the fact those negative times are there for a purpose to get you towards a higher end goal? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's cyclical, Michael, as you know, right? If you, I could send you this little thing that I use with every athlete around resilience and sports is about cycles. You can't do well all the time. It's just impossible to do well all the time because there's so many factors that play into it. You could have injury. You could have another program rising and recruiting, uh, you know, a different, uh, having success in the, in the recruitment process, for example, in professional sports, you have a draft and the draft sometimes now is a lottery. So it's a lottery pick. So you might not get the best players. So you might drop down a little bit. So, um, and sports is about cycles. It's about being cyclical and people have to kind of understand that. And you're always trying to, you know, work towards something. You're always trying to develop your athletes. You're always trying to improve your athletes. You're always trying to get them fractionally better in all of the structural pieces or all the performance pieces, the technical piece, the physical piece, the, the strategic piece. There's always opportunity to work on things, the mental and the emotional piece, which I believe isn't worked on enough. And during those down periods, perhaps during COVID, I have been so busy, Michael, working with athletes, building the mental and the emotional piece and helping them build a structure so that when they do cycle back into um, high level competitive sport, a lot of them have not been able to compete in big events, obviously, because there aren't any. So we're building these pieces. But I think the cycle factor the cycles factor there's down cycles there's up cycles there's down cycles england rugby was tremendous for for quite a a long stretch there maybe they've dipped down now they will dip back up i guarantee is stewart still um with england rugby stewart lancaster no so he left a few years ago so they had a downturn eddie jones has come in from australia um, they got to the World Cup final in the most previous World Cup, lost. And then in the most recent, like, Six Nations, which is a local one, they, they you know, they, they struggled. They lost to Scotland, lost to a, um, a couple of other teams, France, etc. cetera. So um, there's, there's a change, point- though. That makes sense. There's change. They've gone – that's why I asked about Stewart. They've gone from Stewart, 
and Stuart's mindset and Stuart, the, the culture that Stuart established and Stuart's ideas to somebody new now. So there has to be a period maybe of adaptation to figure it out, but they will figure it out and they will uh, develop the program into something. They know what success looks like. They've had it. Yeah. Um, you know, for quite a long time. I know England, I think, was the best rugby team in the world for a period there, weren't they? Yeah, no, <coughs> they were. I guess the thing that's interesting for me is you've got, like, because in the last World Cup, which was still under Annie Jones, they got to the final, which is the level of success. They're essentially one game away from being world champions. Yes. So then, you know, 18 months later, granted COVID has a factor in that, to being quite perceived quite poor, um, and I'd imagine as a player, if you start listening to external factors, you mm-hmm. could say, well, actually, the changes we've made aren't working because we're worse off. But that might be, as you said, of a cyclical process from the coaching staff to say we've got to change some strategies to be successful in the next one. And it's a process within that four years. And I just imagine it's the management of emotion or a management of you know, the athlete's well-being within that process to say this real downtime is going to be necessary to get the eventual improvement to get us beyond where we went before and how you went about managing that sort of structure for an athlete. And it's always working towards something too. You know, it's going to turn. Like I have, and, and every single one of my athletes have downturns. They have a down cycle. So I have to manage them through that down cycle, but they have to be aware. All of a sudden, there's this big shock, Michael, that there's, oh my goodness, I'm in a down cycle or I'm not doing as well as I want to do. But I think the understanding, the acceptance that there is going to be a down cycle, it's not perfect all the time. You're not going to be at the top of the world all the time, but you will be there. You will be there sometimes, which I think is the important part. Sports is very difficult, especially at the highest levels. To try to uh, maintain excellence at the highest levels is so difficult. You have, you know, very, very few examples of that in sports. You see, like I just mentioned, the Golden State Warriors. They were at the top of the world, and then they dipped down. They will be back up again because they have the right culture. They have the right structure in place. Um, They are developing their athletes. They are bringing in the athletes like you talked about to to uh complement their culture so they will be back up again they do things well they have the right structure so again it comes back to the fundamental foundational pieces of of if we talk about an individual athlete if they have the self-awareness if they have the structural pieces if they have the values and the purpose um they have to stay with that and just weather the storm through the down cycle and then they'll be back up again. And they always are. I mean, literally, I have athletes, Michael, call me. I have a guy, I'll have a guy call me and say, um, he'll be in the, let's say he's in the NHL, which is the, the best hockey league in the world, the 700 best hockey players in the world. I'll literally get a phone call and they'll say, say to me, John, I'm in a rut. I've lost my confidence. And I say, whoa. Just a second. So you haven't scored in two games. Let's pull back here a little bit. Let's spend a little bit, maybe more time on the ice. Let's evaluate what's going on the last couple of games. Um, And don't get caught up in giving away your confidence here. You've, you just told me you've lost your confidence. You're giving it away. You you've built confidence over the last, whatever, 20 years, you've been at the, highest level of hockey for 20 years and built a thick thick wall of confidence and you just gave it away to me in two minutes on the telephone so what happens a week later he's practiced a little bit extra five minutes on the ice looked at a few things and now he's scoring again phone rings again hey john the confidence is back it's great my confidence is back there's the cycle that's a mini cycle right drop down um so you have to just weather the storm during those cycles and, and stick with your structure, stick with what you believe in. And, um, and then eventually it'll start cycling back up for you if you're doing the right things and working hard and training every day and just, just staying the course. 
I heard a really nice analogy around confidence the other day and they were saying someone with no confidence is like having a billion pounds in your bank account without a credit card or without a debit card. And I thought that actually that's a real nice thing. If you don't have self-belief or self-confidence, you can't access any of the tools or skills or anything that you've learned um, prior or you've got the experience that you've had because it's all, it's, it's not there. So I think no, yeah, it's, the, it's the preservation totally right. of confidence is really important. Yeah. And, and you really, sometimes confidence is a choice. Like you choose to lose your confidence or you choose to have confidence. So you really have to be careful because again, it gets back to the narrative. And if we back up a bit again, the self-awareness piece is so critical. You have to understand yourself. You have to know yourself because in order to really believe in something, Michael, you have to understand it and you have to know it. If you don't know it and you don't understand it, what are you actually believing in? So that's why the self-awareness piece, if we go back again to that, that's why that piece is so important because the confidence is the next level of that. It's self-awareness in action, really. So um, the book I just wrote, Ride Big, was fascinating, talking to all the best riders in the world about confidence. The book is about confidence because I believe truly that in a lot of sports, equestrian included, that there's a crisis of confidence. And people don't fully understand it and understand how to develop it and sustainably develop it too. So it was fascinating talking to the best in the world and the struggles they've had with confidence and how they've overcome those struggles and being able to build sustainable confidence and get to these, you know, world-class levels. Is there so, anything during those interviews that particularly stood out to you, a particular story or example that really blew you away? Um, a lot of stories. I mean, talking to, uh, there's a guy, he's a writer, he's an inventor and he's German and he's probably the best equestrian athlete the last 20 years. He won the gold medal, uh, in London and he won the gold medal in Rio in eventing, which is like the, uh, triathlon of equestrian sport. So you have to be excellent at dressage, show jumping and cross country. So, uh, and it's very difficult, a very difficult, uh, arduous sport. Um, anyways, he had fascinating things to say. He said, look, I've fallen off the horse a thousand times, but I get back up every time. And I learn something from every single time I fell off. So, and he said, I made a note of that. Um, he was saying fascinating things. And he said, the biggest thing I'd tell young people is you, if you want to get good at something, you have to be prepared to make a lot of mistakes. So make the mistakes, figure out, you know, why you made the mistake and then move forward and then make some more and do the same thing. And uh, there you go. There's a guy who has gotten to the top of the world at what he does. He's like a unicorn, this guy. He's better than everybody else. And this is what he's telling you, right? Um, the other thing he said, too, this was fascinating, too, that you might like, is he said, always go through the problems and not around the problems. So what that means is, he says, if you're training and you're doing something that you know is right, don't take shortcuts, don't take the easy way out. Keep doing it until you're proficient at it and you can do it. And don't go around it because at some point that will catch up to you and uh, will hurt you in the competitive environment. So I thought that was interesting too. Don't go, don't go uh, around the problems, go through the problems. So he said a lot of great things and, and it's, you have to listen to people like that because they've, they've figured out a way to get to the top of the world at what they do. So looking at your experiences within the sport, obviously we spoke briefly off air and you'd mentioned that you basically had none. You had no experience within that particular area. Someone approached you about it and you thought it sounded like a really exciting opportunity and then have kind of dived dived right in if you like so just want to talk through um what that journey was like for you um kind of being a novice I guess to the point where you are now which is um I don't know if you want me to describe you as an expert in the field or no at the, at the very least very proficient in in the field yeah well first of all 
I had the confidence taking all my experience from the other sports. So when you're working in all the professional sports, you have a, a well-rounded sort of uh, body of experience. So I knew I could take that in, but there's nuance in every sport. Like if I came into football, which I've worked in quite a bit, um, you have to understand the, the language. You have to understand the nuance, the performance nuances of everything, the technical pieces, how important are the technical pieces? Uh, understanding the game itself and what you're looking at. Like, what are you looking at? What do you need to see? And what do you need to look at as a coach? So when I came into equestrian sport, obviously the X factor is the horse. I never rode a horse before. And uh, that was the different piece to me and try to understand the relationship of the horse and the rider. And there's this massive emotional relationship between the two because horses are extremely sensitive animals. They feel everything that the rider feels. So if the rider isn't right, for example, the rider's not confident, the rider's feeling anxious, the rider's hesitating, the horse knows. So that goes into the horse. So the other thing that Michael Young told me was his main goal in equestrian sport is to take pressure off of his horses. That's what he does. So he knows that when he gets on the horse, that he has to be really good, meaning that he has to be confident. He can't hesitate. There's no anxiety. He knows what he's doing and he goes and does it. And that goes into the horse and the horse expresses that. So that's interesting. So I had to learn all those pieces too, the connection between uh, the horse and the rider. And I learned it through a lot of work, uh, talking to coaches, going to clinics, uh, going to the best events in the world, watching people, talking to riders. Um, and then I finally worked with a professional rider and was around it a lot. I immersed myself in it for about a year. And so going with him, understanding his challenges and understanding all those things um, and trying to get him to the next level. So the process I have that I use working with an athlete was modified a little bit for that particular sport, as it is in every sport, I have to modify it a bit. So, uh, so and that's how it all happened. Any, it was fun. Do you have any challenges? Cause I'd imagine a new person coming into a sport at times, people might not be the most receptive. So there was, was there any backlash to you coming into the sport? And if there was, how did you come over that? Well, I don't know. You know, I think people found it fascinating because, uh, uh, equestrian sport as a lot of sports are is very insular so you've got all the sort of the experts and the that work only in the sport and here's me <clears throat> coming from outside of the sport so I think people you know some people found that fascinating too and some people wanted to work with me just because they wanted to know hey what are they doing in the NBA how can you bring that to help me because that's something very different that we don't see every day I only, uh, you know, have the access to people who only work in the sport. So I think that was good. But for to, to on the other side, to answer your question, there was fear. There was genuine fear for me because I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to, you know, answer the questions or know enough to really help an athlete. So that took that took a bit of time. But uh, thank goodness I had my my sort of my background in everything that I do as my foundation. And I brought that in and then I shaped it based on, you know, the nuance of the sport, which is every sport's different. Like it's walking into football would be scary too, right? With the coaches and uh, it's a very insular sport. Football is the same way. So walking into that from the outside, let's say an equestrian uh, performance coach walked into uh walked into uh, Manchester United for the first time, that would be intimidating. It would be difficult and it would take time to feel comfortable in that environment and become accepted maybe by some of the coaches because the coaches realize, yes, he knows what he's doing. He, he can help us. Do you so. think by being vulnerable <clears throat> and being uncomfortable in terms of getting on the horse, like you said, you've never been on before, yes. and actually immersing yourself within it as much as you did, was allowed you to gain respect of the athletes and the people you're working with quicker? I don't know if it, well, yes, I, I think definitely. And I was very vulnerable. Like I, I admitted when I first went into it, uh, somebody had called me and said, can you help me? I'm a, I'm a show jumper. I said, I don't know anything about equestrian sport. So, um, but I, I'm going to try to help you. And so I, I, I found it very challenging 
because of the horse factor. So I, I wanted to understand more. And uh, we all need to grow too. I think that's important, Michael. I need to grow too. Like I, I've been working in professional sports for 20 years and this was an opportunity for me to grow a little bit and, and nudge the edges of my comfort zone a little bit, right? And learn something new. And that was fun for me. But yeah, it was, <laughs> it was, uh, I was quite vulnerable for sure. And I made myself vulnerable too. I think that's the, that's the way to do it. And uh, I'm comfortable now in the sport. I'm quite comfortable now. I don't know everything still, but um, I, I know enough that we've really helped some athletes in, in a big way in that sport. So I know what we're doing works and is right. So so, so moving forward for you then, what what do you see your your ambitions to be, or what do you see your next challenge to be? Where do you see this going next? I don't know. the The equestrian just sort of fell into my lap, so I don't know. I'm going to continue to do some of that. I'll continue to work in the other sports. We've branched it out. That's why I love working in the different genres, not just not just sport but working in corporate and there's always challenges in corporate COVID has presented massive challenges for me. Um, it's been exhausting working, you know, the last year uh, in COVID trying to help companies pivot and help develop their people through COVID and trying to keep people motivated and positive through COVID. Um, so that's been a big challenge. And then on the other side, in entertainment, a lot of the actors haven't had work because a lot of you, as you see on Netflix and everything, there's, there's not a lot of new content because they haven't been able to shoot things. Or, And then the same thing with music. A lot of the bands haven't been able to travel and tour. So they've had to kind of reinvent themselves in different ways too. So I've had to help with that. So, so that's, all, that's all challenging. Is there, anything, is there anything COVID's taught you about people or, um, you know, the mental aspects of life that you didn't know before? Yeah, that's a good question. I actually had that conversation the other day with a colleague of mine. Um, I th yeah, I think that initially I was shocked at how non-resilient people were. Like it was shocking to me. People were just not resilient. So we had to build that competency that, look, this is, this is like the, is, like we talked about cycles, right? This is another cycle. Now this is a deep cycle, but this is just another cycle. You're going to come out of this. So how do we, how do we look at this differently and, you know, maybe pivot through it, but look beyond COVID too. And, and what are the opportunities beyond COVID? So having to do all that, but I think that, I was surprised that a lot of people were not uh, really not resilient and we had to build that skill and we had to create perspective and we had to motivate them. Um, they were, they were just throwing in the towel. <laughs> they were throwing in the towel. Really. It was incredible. So what what's the main strategy you would use to do that in terms of building that resilience or teaching them to change a narrative or pivot their way through is there one particular strategy you would use to help someone with that? Certainly the voice every day. We are always sh reshaping and shaping the voice and trying to make sure that the truth comes out. And, you know, a lot of times we, we integrated things like mindfulness practices too, to try to keep people in the moment and not be looking too far ahead and too far forward and trying to ground them in the, you know, in the immediacy of what's happening right now. And a lot of times mindfulness practice is very good for that. We've been using a lot of that with athletes the last probably three years, I would say. And we find it helps too the mindfulness piece. Some don't want to do it. Some aren't interested in it. So you have to find other ways to sort of ground them in being able to um, get themselves to be in the moment and because fear, fear sort of creeps in from either side of the moment, the present moment. You're, you know, sometimes people focus, that's the voice again, focusing on these things that have gone wrong and they bring those forward from the past. And then people looking forward and projecting out that, oh my God, this is a disaster. This is, this is not going to go well. How can I do this? And that's where the voice starts acting up as you move forward. So, so 
that fear factor too is, is, uh, is a big one. And like I said, it, it sort of lives on either side of the present moment. So you have to ground people in the moment and a mindfulness practice often does that teaching people how to do that and, and what's important. So, uh, so a lot of that, the lot, <clears throat> certainly a lot of that to relieve stressors and that sort of thing the past year. And in terms of working with children or kids of younger age groups to make them potentially more resilient or more self-reflective or more confident, is there anything you, you would recommend in doing to try and support them with that? Because I'd imagine if you can make children more self-reflective at younger age, ages, that will only help them kind of going through. And obviously as an adult, they already have that skill set to be a, that's already developed. No, doing really simple things. Reflection is huge. Self-reflection is huge. And that's a big part. You know, that's a big part of what we do. We talked about the process of how I do things. Everything is about journaling, self-reflection, writing things down and focusing. One thing you could do is making sure that the kids or the young people or even the coaches and everybody is focusing on the positive things that the, that the child does or that they do and not on the mistakes all the time. There's always a massive focus on the mistakes. Like for example, when I'm watching coaches and riders and the rider will go in and they'll do their thing in the ring and then they'll come out. The first thing the coach talks about is the mistake. So the best thing you can do is to focus on the great things they did in the ring. Will you get to the mistake? Sure. You can, you can address the mistake and talk about that, but go to the good things first, go to the positive things first, because there's always 95% good and 5% bad. And the focus is always on the 5%. So take the focus off the 5%. Do you have to address the 5%? Sure. You have to address it and you, you have to figure out why that happened, why the mistake happened address it and then move forward right from there. But there's this, that's where the kids, that's where the fear of mistakes comes in because they know that the first thing that's coming out is the mistake. So they're always trying to avoid it. So they're pulled back. There's not that level of self of self-expression that you need. Um, and there's that fear of making mistakes. So I think that's the self-reflection is, is, is a big part of it. Uh, Michael, I really believe, but with my athletes, I get them into the habit of, okay, you are not allowed to, to, to focus at all in the first 10 minutes of your reflection on what went wrong. It's all, what did we do? Well, what went right? What's working in training? Um, you know, what did I do really well? And then you can focus on the second piece. And I'll address that with you too, because I always address sort of the reflection with them and how to deal with it and what it means and, and those sorts of things too. So I'm glad you brought that up because that's an important thing. The self-reflection piece is, is an important piece. Um, those who self-reflect, very few athletes do it. They do not reflect on what happened and you don't necessarily learn from um, um, what actually happens. You learn from the reflecting on it so you don't necessarily learn from experience you learn from ex, uh, reflecting on experience so that's where the learning points sort of come in often I don't I don't know why as I'm listening to you talk I'm kind of having like a sliding scale going in my head almost like a behavioral thing but also uh I guess a, a narrative things in terms of you you mentioned earlier about wanting to win or being closer to winning and like almost I imagine that's the top end and then I'm on a sliding scale of things we can do to get closer and closer to that and things that take you further away it's almost like you know if you're not self-reflecting that takes you a step back if you're not I love this step back yeah. if you're I, I've seen occasions where people don't deal with fader very well and act out in terms of the way that they ho hold the racket or the way they kick out step back. But actually mm -hmm. if I can do all those things, I get closer and closer. It's almost like a sliding scale in terms of you're trying to do as many things right to get you closer to that learning and winning environment as you can. Always. You're always trying to do that and you're doing it through all the performance pieces, right? The technical piece. Um, 
you know, how are we going to move closer through the technical piece? What do we need to improve? What do we need to get better at? And then the physical piece obviously is important. We need to have the, the, the strength, the body, the everything to support that technical piece and then the strategic piece. And then like we talked about uh, quite a bit in this podcast is that the athlete does not have a process to work on the mental and the emotional piece. And that's where sometimes they go backwards in the sliding scale. So they're not getting closer to winning because they're not working on the pieces they need to, 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 to get closer to that winning all the time. And that's those mental and emotional pieces. And you have to work on it. You can't see it, but you have to work on it. That's why athletes don't work on it. They can't see it. Technicals easy. I can see that. I can dribble. I can shoot. I can pass. I can all these pieces, right? The physical piece. I can go into the gym. I can see the development, but often they do not have, they can't see the, the, the mental and the emotional piece. And as you know, as you move up in sport and as you develop more competency in the technical and physical and strategic pieces, all of a sudden the spotlight starts shining on this mental and emotional piece. It becomes more and more important because ultimately it will become the separator um, because everybody at the highest level is technically sound, is physically sound, and usually is fairly strategically sound. So what is the separator? And the separator often is the a piece of the mental and the emotional piece that will strengthen the other pieces and allow you to fully maximize those pieces. So... Do you see much difference between individual sports and individual athletes compared to team? Because I'd imagine that, you know, in a team environment, there can be times where if you're not the most confident or you're, you're struggling or the narrative in your head isn't great, you can hide yourself away in the background a little bit. Whereas in an individual environment, it is on you. And if you're feeling that and your performance suffering because of the way you're having in a dialogue it's going to be evident in your performance because you're going to hit the ball into the net or you're going to shank the ball into the trees or whatever that is. So do you see a difference in the mindset of team to individual sports or would you say that actually it crossover between all, all athletes? Yeah, it always comes down to the individual, Michael, and developing those individual skills. So if it's confidence, if it's self-awareness, if it's resilience, if it's, it could be, you know, many different self-reliance, it could be many different pieces, but there is dynamic, the different dynamics, certainly in, in, in a team sport, because you're surrounded by other individuals, right? And you're playing a role on that particular team. But I would say that, you know, if you're an individual athlete or you're a team athlete, you have to build the individual skills and then you can fit more and, and, and uh, um, be more successful within the team environment when you do develop those skills. So, but you're right. I mean, it's possible. It is different because, you know, the spotlight's on you in an individual sport and there's nobody to blame it on, but I don't have an athlete that blames on teammates anyway. So that's, that's, <laughs> I hope they're not doing that. So uh, it always comes down to you, right? the coach sees you as an individual and it always comes down to you. So, and, and how you sort of fit into the, the model and the environment that the, that the coach or the club wants you to fit into. So, uh, but you have to have those mental and emotional skills in order to, you know, fully express those skills and be successful within that environment. Perfect. Listen, this is the last question I'm going to ask you. Which okay. Is something I ask everyone. Must be a hard one. It, it might be. It might be. Which is who's the, I guess for you, the most impressive or the most thought provoking coach or athlete or speaker or whatnot you've worked with and why? That I've worked. Oh God, I've worked with so many incredible people, like, and seen so many incredible coaches. Um, Oh boy. That's a really hard question because there's, there's so many and they all have, they're all different. They're all bring something, but, but they're all, they're all uh, have commonalities too. Like the coaches create the amazing culture that athletes can thrive in and they're empathetic. They can put themselves in the athlete's shoes. Uh, they say the right thing at the right time. They know what the athlete needs. Um, uh, 
And it's difficult too to do that sometimes because of the uh, the generational gap. You know, there's you have these. You know, in the club uh, at Southampton, the generational gap between some of the coaches and the players coming in, and the mindsets are so different. So you have to be able to adapt to those mindsets and the new, you know, the way of thinking that uh, some of the athletes you know, have, and it, if you're talking about today, it's today, you know, what do they have today in 10 years from now, it'll be different again. There'll be another sort of generation coming in. So um, I think the ones that can adapt certainly to that generation specifically, I don't think I have a specific cause I, I get to work with the best in the world at what they do. So it's, it's just some, they're so good. I use the example of the rider uh, certainly Michael Young and writing the, writing this book and talking, you know, going out of my way to talk to the best riders in, on the planet. So, um, no, that's fine. I think from my perspective, I'm always fascinated to hear the reason why. So what is it that makes that person or that individual group individual stand out? And I think what you said there in terms of creating a culture or creating an environment and being able to adapt to, to what the athletes need or what the the situation stuff needs is, is a really interesting point for why they're so yeah. highly regarded. I would say the other one, a really good one with respect to uh, what I see from the very, very top athletes in the world is that they all are original. They're not a copycat of anything. They have their own style. They have their own belief. They have their own way to do things. And if you look at the best athletes in history, they're all incredibly different. And I always say if, if like sometimes people ask me on podcasts, what's one piece of advice you have for athletes? And I say, and some don't understand it. So I have to explain it. Don't be the cover band, never be the cover band, always be the original thing because that's what people want to see. They want to see the original thing. They want to see the Messi. They want to see the Ronaldo. Think about how different those people are but both have risen to the top, uh, you know, of the sport, perhaps, you know, two of the best players of all time. And you, you'd look at them side by side and say, you got to be kidding. Like these, these are the two best players in the world. They're so different, but that's why they're the two best players in the world, because they express themselves for who they are. They're very original. They understand themselves well. So people don't want to see the cover band really. They go to the cover band. If the cover band's playing great, but they don't go out of their way to see the cover band. They go out of their way to see the real thing, the original thing. So you have to own that and you have to sort of take responsibility for that. And you have to sort of make sure you covet that uh, being, being different and being original, I think is really important. Perfect. Listen, John, a brilliant conversation, which I'm sure uh, was insightful for everyone. And um, I hope so. Yeah, no, it was great. So thanks very much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, keep up the great work. Cheers. Much appreciated. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.